aura cette, cette rencontre aura deux parties. D'une part, une présentation euh, d'une 20 minutes, une demi-heure environ, et puis une deuxième partie de questions-réponses. So uh, this is uh, welcome to this event hosted by the Quebec Circular Economy Research Network. So this is Circular Economy Month, and we're delighted to have to welcome Dr. Patrick Schroeder. Patrick, thank you for joining us despite the time zone challenges. So uh, let me introduce you a little bit. So Patrick is a senior research fellow at the at the Environment and Society Centre of the Chatham, Chatham House in the UK. And Patrick's research focuses on the global transition to an inclusive circular economy with a particular research emphasis on the international policy coordination, bridging the investment gap, the role of social global trade and the contribution of the circular economy to achieving the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So, and, and, um, Over the last year, Chatham House has initiated a global roadmap for an inclusive circular economy, which aims to strengthening global cooperation on circular economy issues while advancing the sustainable development goals. And uh, so, and the, 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 this important research meets the gap of uh, the following gap, which is the fact that many, many, there have been many initiations, many, many projects of circular economy maps have been initiated in many settings, uh, regional, sub-regional, municipal, national levels. And so the, there's a the need for inter-organizational or intergovernmental coordination for that and to make these uh, roadmaps, um, to help these roadmaps being implemented. So before we hand over to Patrick to talk about this global uh, roadmap, Uh, I'd like just to highlight a couple of uh, upco up 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 upcoming seminars. So on December 5th, we'll have a seminar between, on the links between the circular economy and biodiversity. And on the 12th of December, we'll have a set webinar on the industrial symbiosis of Kalundborg in Denmark. And so I think on the webs, on the, in the chat, you now have the, the web links for you to register to these events. And last thing, please note that this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay on the Research Network's website in the coming days. So um, feel free to ask, save all your questions for the end and, and, or, and enter them in the chat as we go along. And so I wish you an excellent seminar. And now I'll, the floor is yours, Patrick. So thank you. Bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Um, merci beaucoup, Emmanuel. Um, bonjour à tous. Um, uh, merci beaucoup pour l'invitation à présenter notre recherche. Um, je suis tr 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 uh, très heureux d'être ici uh, aujourd'hui. Um, and I will um, show my presentation in, in English. Let me share my screen first. Okay, I hope you can see this. Um, share the screen. Oops, sorry. So you just saw that backwards. We uh, we just tested that earlier. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So um, great. Um, so the topic uh, of the presentation today and um, there's a global roadmap for an inclusive circular economy from Stockholm plus fifty to the summit of the future. And uh, this is um, based on work that I'm doing together with my colleague, Jack, Jack Berry. Uh, we're both uh, research fellows at Chatham House. We're a think tank uh, based in London in the UK. And um, as part of our work, we're looking at the global transition to an inclusive circular economy. Um, so that's uh, one of the, the key aspects that we're trying to highlight with our work that um, There needs to be international cooperation uh, to make this transition happen. Um, countries will unlikely be able to do this on their own. Um, and especially in times of uh, geopolitical tensions, there is a trend towards countries uh, looking inward or also maybe towards more resource nationalist approaches where cooperation becomes more difficult. Um, What we've identified through our work is that, especially countries in the global south, 
um, also will need to be supported in the, uh, in the, in the transition. And um, so that aligns uh, very much also with uh, the Summit of the Future that took place uh, recently in New York, where we presented this paper, um, where we tried to show again how the um, circular economy can revive the sustainable development goals. Um, and we presented a set of priorities that we think should start immediately. But we also outlined the idea how um, circular economy can contribute to um, a new international development framework uh, that comes after 2030. Uh, so that's the paper, and I will present more details from, from that paper uh, as we go along. But I also wanted to mention a little bit about the background. And this is a process that actually started uh, two, year, two years ago at the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. And we presented an initial uh, paper uh, on this idea of a global roadmap to an inclusive circular economy. Um, so that was presented and then afterwards, we received quite a lot of good feedback from organizations around the world. Um, uh, some of the organizations here, you can see the logos, um, they joined with us to form somewhat of a more closer uh, type of um, group to coordinate and, and to drive this forward. But in addition to this, there were about 400 organizations that expressed their interest and their support for this. I think some of you might have also signed up or expressed your interest and uh, I think that's how we um, also shared information with you about what's uh, what we're doing and the, the event in New York and um, other things. Now um, I also uh, need to uh, quickly acknowledge our cooperation with UNIDO. Um, so this is um, a, a program financed by the European Union and the government of Finland uh, to support uh, countries in, uh, especially uh, the three countries in which we work on, Bangladesh, um, Ghana, no, sorry, Bangladesh, Morocco, and Egypt in the value chains, textiles, plastics, and ICT. And that's an example of how international cooperation to drive circular economy um, uh, can, can work in practice. Um, so now, then shifting uh, to the report and the, the more content related. So these are the five pathways that we identified. Um, uh, and these are uh, relevant for the international level or even the multilateral system. So this includes embedding justice and inclusivity principles and in circular economy transitions, enhancing policy coordination, especially when it comes to national roadmaps and action plans. Um, the third point is uh, about the reform of the financial architecture, and that links specifically to the discussions on MDB reform, uh, which were also a big topic uh, at the Summit of the Future uh, in New York just recently. Uh, then how to rewire the global trade system um, to make it work for circular um, goods and services. And the fifth uh, on shared stan standards and metrics. And uh, as Cathy was telling before, uh, in the last event, there was um, a speaker from ISO, uh, which is really interesting and an important development. And that's also something that we refer to in, in the uh, report. So now, um, the reason why uh, inclusivity is important uh, so this is a picture from Gilets Jaunes in France uh, some years back, uh, protests against um, changes in energy pricing. Um, so it's, there's, there's two aspects to that. One obviously is we have existing environmental injustices that, that need to be addressed and the circular economy can do this by eliminating waste and pollution. As, as we know, it's, it's often marginalized communities um, that are impacted by, or disproportionately impacted by pollution and mismanaged waste. Um, but forward-looking, there are also uh, countries or communities which will be, and workers and industries who will be impacted by the transition. And um, so 
these concerns need to be taken into account. Um, and not for, for two reasons also. Uh, on the one hand, uh, if, if these are not taken into account, then there will be political resistance. Um, then uh, there's an internet, this on national level, but on international level, um, if there are, there are countries uh, in value chains that might see quite some disruption as we shift to circular economy value chains, um, and these countries will also be impacted. Um, so that that needs to be needs to be considered. And so that's why we're suggesting on the international level to have uh, more of a mechanism to address this. Um, so we we're asking to establish some global guidelines for ensuring social equity in the transition to a circular economy. Um, and uh, there are examples how this is done. Um, we're pointing specifically to ECOSOC, uh, also to include um, aspects of indigenous communities in this. Um, another aspect is the issue around how to, what, what are best practices in measuring decent work in the circular economy? As, as we know, there are many informal sectors currently involved in um, informal work around not only management of waste, but uh, also repair services. Um, many clusters around the world work on uh, some type of manufacturing, but in very informal ways uh, in very hazardous working conditions. <clears throat> and uh, so examples are e-waste, um, but also shipwrecking industries. Um, and so these are actually, for some countries, significant sectors. Um, and there's some ongoing work done by the ILO, and um, but also Circular Economy Foundation and World Bank are some of the organizations that are driving this agenda forward. So that that needs to be um, embedded also in, in the international um, level. Now, when it comes to the second point about um, policy coordination, so this builds on some of the previous work and research that we've done, where we have this circular economy policy tracker, um, where we're trying to understand how, how governments are implementing not only action plans, but also uh, the policies. And we've done a national, a global stock take. Um, that's a publication that was uh, published earlier uh, this year with UNIDO. So there are 75 countries with uh, existing roadmaps and strategies um, within these roadmaps, there's close to 3,000 policies spanning 70 sectors and, and 20 uh, policy categories. Um, and you, you can see the uptake or the change over time. Uh, so this is uh, a few years ago where we had only a few roadmaps and Japan was actually the first country to initiate one, not the European countries. They came later. Um, but then... A lot of European countries um, have roadmaps, but also in other places. We see uh, uptake in Africa, uh, Latin America. Um, so the Global South is also uh, very much in the process of um, de designing these uh, policies. Um, so that's the uh, the stop take uh, report. It's also online on on the website. Uh, can be downloaded. Um, and so these are again the, the, the big numbers, the 75 not roadmaps, the policy commitments, etc. And then these different categories. So you can really see that this is uh, not only within the environmental field. So it really goes broader than uh, environmental ministries uh, remit. Um, so covering all these other issues around also research and innovation, business support, uh, worker or consumer rights. Um, so really shows these are very comprehensive roadmaps, but that makes them also very difficult to, uh, to implement. And um, so there's also specific targets that some countries have uh, uh, put forward. Um, again, these targets on resource productivity, um, also uh, a kind of 
this is one of the um, important ones. There's also recycling targets that some country put forward. Um, the Netherlands actually put forward the, the target of being fully circular by 2050. Um, so these are good, but again, they're very, they're different and they're not necessarily aligned. Um, countries haven't talked to each other about the targets that we set. Is this the right ambition or how will this potentially impact then uh, on other countries, especially because we know there's a lot of, for example, uh, material, if we look at material flows, they are cross-border. Um, so changing um, um, material consumption levels, all of this has uh, has impacts um, beyond an individual country. These are some of the sectors, or these the main sectors um, that uh, national roadmaps uh, focusing on. So you can see construction and build environment, uh, which is, as you know, will account for the largest share of material consumption in, in any country. But also plastics high on the agenda, uh, also with the uh, Global Plastics Treaty coming up and all these concerns around microplastics, um, PFAS on uh, uh, human health impacts, um, uh, food and energy, electronics, ICT mining, etc. cetera. Um, so basically the key message that we took from this roadmap analysis into the work on on the global roadmap uh, and, and the message also for the summit of the future is that there's currently no institutional global home for the circular economy um, where there is some level of uh, coordination um, on multilateral level, but also no facility that uh, can coordinate countries. Oops. Sorry. So um, what we're suggesting, uh, and the, these are two suggestions, there's others, but the, the, the most relevant one, and this is actually where um, we build on the work uh, or the publication by the International Resource Panel, uh, who published the Global Resources Outlook earlier this year, um, calling for something like an international resource agency. Um, some, this could be similar to uh, the International Energy Agency that we have, um, that was, which was set up in the late 1970s when there was a global, when there's the energy crisis. And the International Energy Agency plays an important role in convening, but also coordinating research, providing data, um, and something like that for, for global resources would be very useful. Um, and provide uh, then also policy coordination between uh, between governments. Um, then another proposal that we try to put forward is to have something like a cross-sectoral circular economy alliance, um, consisting not only of governments, but also MDBs, um, private sector, civil society, um, and we at the moment have the Global Alliance on Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency, um, which is a smaller club type of um, organization, or let's say network, it's not even an organization, but it's coordinated by UNIDO and UNEP has a number of member countries. Um, I think I think Canada might be a member as well. I'm not quite sure, uh, would have to check, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a small group so far um, and it doesn't it's not fully representative and, and the, the, the other problem is it doesn't have a global mandate to it's also underfunded um, and uh, so it's not functional to the degree that we would need on the on the international level so that could be for example upscaled or, or, or boosted then um, the next point that we try to make is about um, the financing and the funding um, for generally circular economy businesses, but also for roadmap implementation. Uh, so implementing a circular economy roadmap on national level will require uh, resources. Um, 
this is an estimate that Ghana put forward. How much would it cost to implement their roadmap? Um, equivalent to three percent of GDP. Other countries might have probably have similar similar needs, um, and yeah, so far there's no dedicated financing mechanism for these things. Um, we know there are some from the European context, for example, we know that there are some of the European uh, banks like the European Investment Bank or the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development who provide some sort of uh, development finance for partner countries, um, especially in, in the European context. It's DG near countries, so the countries surrounding Europe, uh, in, for example, Eastern Europe, uh, Northern Africa, uh, increasingly also Central Asia, um, but there's nothing on the international level to support um, uh, developing countries in the implementation of, of circular economy uh, uh, policies um, or support uh, in particular uh, small and medium-sized companies that are often part of global value chains. Um, so what we thought could, could be an, uh, a good development the establishment of um, a global circular economy fund. So that could be potentially modeled after the Green Climate Fund, but then uh, provide investments to those initiatives and businesses that are not covered by just climate. Um, so that that's, um, that's a solution that we put forward. And uh, some of the MDBs that we engage with uh, in, um, in New York, they, they actually like the idea. Um, so we're thinking now uh, to develop that a bit further as a concept and maybe present that uh, next year. There's an important summit that takes place. This is the, um, the International Conference on Financing for Development um, that will take place in Spain. Um, so one idea is to uh, flesh out this concept and, and try to present it and um, maybe that will get more traction. So again, um, now this goes to the trade, uh, to the trade aspect, um, as I tried to also to, to highlight at, at the beginning. So no country can achieve this transition on its own. Um, we're all very much interconnected through trade. Um, And um, however, uh, so far, the, the trade system, there are many barriers uh, when it comes to, um, so that, I mean, there's different, there's different issues. There are, there are issues around um, illegal shipments and dumping of, of waste. Uh, that's still, uh, still a problem. There are some multilateral um, mechanisms like the Basel Convention trying to prevent these illegal shipments. Um, however, often, uh, often this uh, also acts as a barrier to having a traceable and transparent um, trade in circular goods and services and uh, secondary materials. Uh, so all of that also is ba uh, connected to a very technical issues around how different uh, kind of like secondhand items, recycled products um, or recycled materials, secondary materials or uh, products that are repaired, um, how this is classified through the harmonized systems code. Um, so on that level, there needs to be a lot of updating uh, to be able to, to classify that formally. Um, so there are on WTO level, some initiatives taking place. Uh, these are still so far quite informal, um, but if more countries, especially countries that want to lead on this topic, uh, would come together, this could, these could become more formal processes and um, uh, that could then also help uh, to advance um, more traceability and transparency within within the circular economy trade. Um, there's there's another 
a number of other issues related uh, lack of capacity, for example, of border agencies to be able to um, distinguish and make uh, make the right assessments about different types of um, secondary products and materials being shipped. So there would need to be some concerted effort also to build uh, capacity, uh, for example, through the World Customs Organization, uh, etc. Um, now, this is the last part that we have. You're probably familiar with this, right? The ISO 15, 000, 59,000 series that's come up. So there's there's quite a um, uh, some good standards uh, that are coming for measuring and assessing circular economy. The data sheets on on kind of product circularity. Um, so that was actually, a, um, as you probably heard, was a five year process. Um, also a good example of international cooperation how countries come together and, and uh, work together on these standards. Um, one thing that uh, we wanted to highlight and uh, the World Business Council on Sustainable Development is also one of the partners that we've been engaging with. Um, so the World Business Council on Sustainable Development are working on what they call a global circularity protocol. Um, this is very much industry driven, uh, but includes a lot of companies from around the world. So it is, it is an international process. Um, companies are realizing that they need to have a common framework to measure circularity um, across their value chains. Um, they need to have the right set of um, KPIs. Um, so the ambition of this global circularity protocol is, is to develop such a framework. Um, so that's, that was also the event where Emmanuel joined on, on the 26th, where there were a number of also businesses. Uh, so the World Business Council presented that, like a first report that they uh, commissioned that was done by Deloitte and Circle Economy. Um, and uh, there's more work going ahead um, over the next uh, couple of years or so. So I think the ambition is to have the circularity protocol uh, operational and ready to be adopted by companies around 2026 or so. Um, so yeah, we need to see how this how this goes. Um, they've had some previous example with the global, I think it was the carbon protocol uh, that they developed. Um, obviously that probably is not going to be the final piece, uh, but it is an important, important part of the process uh, to get um, some of the uh, global businesses onto the same page when it comes to measuring and um, uh, then also being able to benchmark where benchmark different companies against each other to see who's doing well and who's, who's uh, doing not so well. Now, um, as part of the, these are the five pathways or five areas for action that we recommend. Um, in addition to this, we trying to look forward and this, this is where the uh, roadmap 2050 idea comes together, um, comes together with the SDGs. Uh, so what we did, um, we extended hypothetically the uh, SDGs up to 2050. And for each of the SDGs, we, uh, well, um, sorry, let me go back a step first. Um, so what we are proposing uh, is that the circular economy could be used as um, a framework, as, like a systems approach to uh, to address uh, the SDGs and as a, as an approach for global development. Um, so, one of the big issues um, with SDG implementation is that often these are implemented in silos. Um, the circular economy, as as such a cross cutting approach, could potentially address that problem um, because you would have a more systematic approach to issues that are looked at. In different ways, including, for example, waste and pollution, employment, poverty, gender, and inclusiveness. So, uh, here the circular economy can can provide this approach 
that would then tackle multiple SDGs at, at, at once. Um, so what we're proposing is uh, to put a high level circular economy obje objective in the emerging post 2030 framework, um, also set global circular economy targets on, on resource use and waste. Um, this will probably be difficult um, because based on our experience, a lot of governments do not support global targets on resources. Um, but we can, can frame this in, in positive ways uh, that we have global targets on waste elimination. And we see maybe something like this already in the treaty on plastics, but also global targets on, uh, for example, uh, recycling, uh, recycling rates or recovery. Um, then next, integrating circular economy targets across all the SDGs. And the next slide, I think, will be will be more to that. Um, the fourth point that we're making is to align the circular economy targets uh, with the UN's Beyond GDP initiative. And uh, there were also several meetings on, on this in New York. It's a working group that was set up by Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, and it brings together statistical agencies uh, from around the world to not get rid of GDP, but think of additional indicators, for example, for well-being, or the natural capital um, or ecosystem services frameworks, um, to bring these frameworks together and come up with a more suitable uh, framework to measure um, economic progress and or economic performance, uh, so to speak. Um, so that that would also be really useful for circular economy because uh, a lot of circular economy initiatives or circular economy businesses as well uh, would benefit from additional indicators to show the benefit they can provide in terms of environmental, uh, environmental performance, but also potentially um, uh, social benefits. And then uh, the first point is creating measurable, uh, measurable indicators for inclusive circ circular economy by, by 2050. Um, and so this is, uh, this is what we have in the paper. So for each of, each of the SDGs, we hypothetically then think what could be a circular economy target uh, that could be achieved. Um, and, and I won't go through all of these, um, but in a way, this is to show that circular economy is not only not only sits within SDG 12 and responsible consumption and production, but really contributes to all of these, and and will be uh, will be important to uh, to achieve all of these. I mean, for, for example, just uh, on affordable and clean energy, we know there's the big issues around now the material demands that um, uh, low carbon energy systems will have. Um, so the first generations of renewable energy technologies are reaching the end of life. Um, they haven't been designed with a circular economy in mind. Um, so we're already facing this, um, this mountain of waste. Um, at the same time, uh, critical raw materials are needed. Um, and there's increasing also thought on what, uh, how to recover these, how to design renewable energy technologies in a way that they become modular, that they can be repaired and refurbished. Um, so to really be able to provide affordable and clean energy by 2050, so circularity needs to be integrated into the new energy systems. Um, just a way of time, I'm sorry. Um, this is the last slide I have. Um, so in addition to these targets, we also have a very long table uh, where we propose uh, what we call levers. Um, and these are levers across governance, economy and finance, science and technology and individual and collective action. So these levers in a way enable or open up pathways um, to, to achieve these uh, targets. Um, so this is the, the example for SDG on poverty. So where we have the, the target that circular goods and service provide access, affordable access 
uh, to to basic services uh, for the poor, and then um, also that localized circular economy businesses and livelihoods enable community resilience to economic shocks and environmental disasters. And so for each of these, we then have the levers and on, on governance, for instance, and this is for example, uh, also a uh, discussion that we had with United Nations Development Programme and the World Bank as we were there. In, so these organizations are developing um, strategies to address uh, poverty uh, for, for governments in, in, in many countries. So it really makes sense actually to, to bring in circular economy thinking into this, how to provide uh, employment and how to provide goods and services for underserved communities. Um, so that then links also to loans for micro and small and medium-sized companies or, or waste entrepreneurs. There are many examples of this kind of waste entrepreneurship in, in uh, the developing countries. Um, this actually has a double benefit, um, provides local employment in communities, and it also reduces the waste that often these communities are uh, suffering from. Um, at the moment, it's, it's difficult for them to access finance. They depend on grants rather than um, a kind of like private uh, private finance, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, I'll stop here. Uh, happy to answer any questions, and then, then there's uh, more on this um, in, in the report, if you have time to, to read that. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Thank you very much. Cathy, do you want to manage the questions, or...? Um, sure. Thank you so much. Um, very interesting. So, as mentioned, you can use the chat or raise your hand. Uh, questions can be asked in English and French. Answers will be given in English primarily, but um, some assistance translation can be provided. Uh, perhaps, uh, 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 Dr. Patrick, would you mind um, un um, how should I say, unsharing your screen? Unshare, yeah. All right, thank you. So we have the first question from Natasha Bouchain from the City of Montreal. Natasha, would you like to ask your question or should we ask it for you? You can ask it for me. Oh, Natasha. Okay. So, uh, Natasha uh, would like to know what role cities play in this global roadmap. Several cities have already taken steps to make their territory more circular, even if the national level has not yet defined a plan to accelerate circularity. Yeah, no, absolutely. Cities are really important um, as like subnational actors. Um, we also know in, from Europe, a lot of cities have circular economy action, action uh, circular economy action plans. Um, cities often can move faster than than national governments. Um, we've engaged with a number of cities uh, in the past as well. Um, uh, yeah, in the, I think. Maybe that's an oversight in the in the paper, but I guess cities can also play a very important role in international uh, cooperation because I know through networks like ICLE, there are already exchanges between different cities on on circular economy related policies. Um, but at uh, at the same time, also uh, cities are constrained in some of the things, so they. Also, again, cities cannot solve everything on their own because uh, the the resource flows, what goes in and what comes out of cities, um, often goes beyond also the um, this is ju jurisdiction. Um, also, then when it comes to like let's say like standards, although a lot of for, for the built environment, for instance, often these standards are made on national level, um, but not on city level. Uh, so that's that's again, yeah. So they they play an important role, but they're still part of a bigger system, where um, uh, where they do not necessarily have all the influence, or also depend on what's decided on um, on other levels. Thank you. I see Chantal has her hand raised. 
Hi, uh, thank you, Patrick. Really interesting. Um, something that you didn't mention today, but is in the report, and it's somebody uh, who that's you know uh, listening that wrote me in the chat to say that it's in the report, and it's how um, you know the financing and investment in circular economy uh, is increasing, but it's still really small scale. You know, if we compare to what we're actually uh, investing in the linear economy. Um, so I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that, if you have any as to, you know, at this stage in the game, you know, what do we need to, you know, yes, we want to increase what we want, which is the circularity, but we also need to reduce what we don't want, which is the linearity. And, you know, at this stage of the game, what do we need at this point? Is it further research, political lobbying? You know, what's uh, what's what's needed? Thank you. Uh, yeah, good, yeah, good point. All of this, yeah. No, um, uh, the, fir the first aspect is... is Measuring what what is circular finance is, is very difficult. Um, so um, we tried to do this in a paper a couple of years, two three years ago, um, uh, just based on the information that's available online. And I think that's also what what we put in the paper. So it's kind of like between three to five percent of public finance, but also what companies spend uh, goes towards circular. Um, maybe it's a bit more now but it's still outnumbered by what goes into the linear economy. Um, so there's lots of constraints of, that investors have. Um, I mean, there's, there's these different issues in terms of... Um, one, one of these is uh, to determine what is a circular business model. Um, to this end, there's increasingly also uh, taxonomies that are being developed with very specific criteria. Um, this puts again more need on the data that need to be provided by businesses on the resources, how they use it, how circular they are. That's again how, for example, the Global Circularity Protocol can potentially also help. Um, but I think one of the bigger questions is that Linear, linear business or linear investments generate higher returns compared to circular business models. So as long as investors just look for quick returns and high returns, the circular business, business will, will miss out. Um, so that's, that's, again, also a question that, for example, financial institutions might need to expand also their metrics on how they evaluate. Um, so if they only evaluate on the returns of investment, but not look sufficiently at the environmental or social benefits, then the linear economy will always be more attractive. Um, there's also other issues around perception of risk. Um, so a lot of the smaller businesses um, are, yeah, perceived to be too risky. Um, they can't they can't attract the investment that they might need to to scale up. Um, and I think yeah maybe that's that's all lots of lots of barriers unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. We have another question online from Stephanie Jagu. Stephanie would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Um, so hi, thank you for that presentation. Um, this morning, I happened to be um, at a seminar uh, provided, a webinar provided by Circular Economy. And they were presenting, among other things, the efforts about uh, uh, trying to comply with the uh, CRSD and the European uh, reporting standard. And uh, mentioning also that they had done a with Deloitte locally a survey of all that was possible and existed right now in terms of potential standards, protocols, or methodology to report and measure uh, circularity. Um, and so one of your proposals seemed to be uh, the, um, the creation of an international agency. And um, I would like very much if you could dig uh, into this subject and, and maybe explain better how you foresee that could help in uh, bringing more coherence internationally <laughs> uh, and therefore helping um, companies who have an international um, reach uh, to comply and actually adapt, you know, motivate them basically. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, good point. Um, 
Yeah, as I, as I um, mentioned before, we've been looking a little bit at what the International Energy Agency is doing um, in terms of kind of like coordination analysis of um, uh, kind of countries, but providing also policy advice and providing also platform. Um, when it comes to, so the International Energy Agency doesn't have any, uh, let's say, um, enforcement type of uh, role to play. Um, this would be like another level um, if we if we wanted to have an agency that can enforce um, internationally for companies to comply to to specific um, requirements, I think that the first one I think is an easier uh, effort, and you would probably get countries because you will need countries actually to uh, to agree to setting something like that up. Um, the UN or the OECD would, and the International Energy Agency emerged out of an uh, OECD initiative. Um, uh, so there needs to be some countries to champion this, and then this could gain um, traction. Um, I think if we uh, are proposing something, I mean, the, the, other, uh, the other idea that people discuss often is to have something like an international treaty on resources. Um, that would then have also legally binding, uh, let's say, requirements on on countries and and uh, companies. Um, that could be another mechanism, but that also seems, uh, let's say, uh, politically quite complicated, or maybe not even feasible. Although it would be, I agree, it would be desirable to have that. Um, we will see something like this with the plastics treaty. Um, and something like that, the plastics treaty could be expanded to other, let's say, um, materials uh, or, or categories. Um, I think that the one of one of the areas that we've been looking at is also um, global textiles value chains. These are also highly un, un, underregulated. There's no type of global type of policy for this, and as a result, we see massive oil production also massive dumping of textile waste. Um, and that's that's the lack of having some coordinated policy uh, on this. Um, so the treaty might might provide some inspiration for, for these things. And I, I just saw Daniel, your uh, comments that the QR code is not working. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. They, they expire after a while, I think. <laughs> and then the Quebec roadmap. Um, yeah, we need to, uh, we need to include that in, in our uh, next stock take, but also in, on our website. So I think that the issue is that we've mainly looked at national mm -hmm. uh, roadmaps. So, but uh, obviously on on some national level, there's also lots of things happening that are important. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Is this a follow up question or a new question? I see your hand. Is it, well, it is kind of a follow up question. Is uh, I understand, and thank you very much for your answer. Um, I understand that yes, there are definitely limitations about. Um, um, creating such an agency and uh, not only politic, but also in time. And related to time, I'm wondering um, with the uh, the number of, of proposals that you've presented this morning, in your opinion, uh, given the fact that we don't have much time, you know, if we look uh, at the situation in a holistic manner, uh, including climate change, including biodiversity losses and planetary limits and everything, if we try to think in a, in a shorter term um uh, view uh, amongst the proposals you made this morning, which one would you would you say would bring um, the highest results in the shortest uh, span? Good question. Yeah, um, let's say I, I think maybe the um, Global Circularity Fund uh, could do quite a lot. Um, not necessarily in terms of. Well, maybe even in terms of volumes, but to to set a kind of like signal also to the finance financial industry that this is this is um, an, an important area, and um, this would also set a signal for uh, developing countries that 
um, there, there is sufficient international support um, to, to, to support the transition. Um, that's, for example, that, that's one of the one of the questions that keeps coming up also from from um, partners we talk to in Africa or in, in ASEAN. Um, uh, so kind of like where, where's where's the commitment? I mean, it's a bit a bit similar to uh, to climate, um, but not necessarily as let's say. Uh, polarized um, the debate between global north and global south but um, yeah so I mean this fund would then also be uh, possibly you can uh, you can use it to facilitate implementation of national roadmaps um, so that could have uh, positive um, implementation effects uh, and because there's also now the discussions on MDB reform taking place. So if, if, if this can be brought into, into these uh, changes that, that will happen, that could be that could be important. Uh, I mean, the other, I guess for business, this is where the circularity protocol and now we also have the ISO standards. I think these could be, these could be game changers, uh, potentially where business can overcome some of the problems they're currently facing. Um, and this is also something where businesses can potentially move without having, um, without necessarily the, uh, the, the, the policies that, that need to be in place. Um, on the trade aspect, I think that that would be a little bit slower, um, especially because uh, politics within the WTO are quite uh, complicated especially currently everyone's talking about decoupling and there's lots of shifts in how, how global trade and investments uh, function. Uh, yeah, some, some of them, I think these, these may be the ones which we can hope for immediate uh, um, or short-term results, let's say. Great, we all noted those down. So um, maybe one last question from Shabina Shalet. I'm sorry, we're running. We might run a little long. Um, we'll see how it's long okay. the question answer takes. Sabrina, ton micro. Merci, Cassie. Um, hi, Patrick. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so I work for the Ministry of the Environment, Fight Against Climate Change, Fauna and Parks of the Government of Quebec, and I'm the one of the main responsibles for the, um, the governmental uh, roadmap in circular economy for Quebec. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, uh, I liked uh, Daniel's comment on putting up uh, our roadmap on your on your map. That would be we'll, great we'll to that. have a, mm -hmm. an yeah. international uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, widespread. Um, what I wanted to add is um, in our roadmap, we linked our 50 measures in circular economy to uh, the SGDs to the, the global de development uh, goals. And um, uh, that's one thing. So we've kind of like done some part of um, connecting the local to the international. Um, and another another thing I wanted to say is that because now we are uh, implementing the, the roadmap into um, a plan, an action plan, we're kind of um, looking at um, all the the levers, all the the, the programs, the financial programs, the research programs where we have within uh, the government already. And we are finding that there is already some money, uh, actually a lot of money, um, which is being put in circular economy. So yes, we need to um, add uh, resources, but I think it's also looking at the, the existing money, the existing resources where we're putting um, our, our beads right now and trying to change or, or prioritize um, the, um, the circular economy strategies within those levers. So it's not only adding new money, but it's also just changing the programs, the research um, that we are doing now. Okay, yeah, great. No, this is encouraging to hear. Um, so, no, this is... Um... That's excellent. Uh, 
how do you how do you actually how do you find the coordination with other ministries uh, on this one because you're leading it but it would also involve probably other well departments um it's going very well uh we could have a conversation uh, together if you're interested because i'm not <laughs> super comfortable sharing it with right. everyone but um okay. it's going very well uh i think um writing a roadmap um getting it adopted by um by the political side is one one part of the 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 work but then implementing it is another and that is uh, only possible through uh collaborative governance and um trying to um putting people together actually making them talk uh, making them um uh, realize that they can work uh, in a team to because they have common goals thank you so much for this thank you so much patrick this was very interesting we're obviously running out of time um it was a first it was our first webinar in english and i'm glad to see the great turnout and everybody uh being involved um thank you wholeheartedly the best of luck and we're here to collaborate at different levels and with different stakeholders if you ever need us. Um, in the chat, my colleagues are gonna put in the next webinars and activities that you can look out for. Um, thank you again and wishing you all a great afternoon, evening, depending where you are <laughs> um, on the planet. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Merci thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Everyone, thank you.